Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to uh, to meet you all during our first uh, Game Camp uh, webinar. Uh, we're meeting again to to share the knowledge, experience uh, from like gaming, mobile gaming, and and, uh, and apps. Today we'll have the uh, presentation uh, related to the mobile gaming measurement and uh, uh, around apps and mobile gaming. We can see it on the next slide. Uh, we see. Let's let's actually uh, welcome our today's uh, speakers, mm, Michal Grno, uh, Adam uh, uh, Michal Grno from Pixel Federation, Adam Longcorn from Reality Games, uh, Martin Linek uh, from App Agent, uh, Jan Wojtyzek uh, from Google, and and me. Hello, uh, and, it, and it's great to uh, to uh, uh, meet you all. Hi, Mariusz. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Marius. Just a note, Veet from our team is also here today. So introducing him, uh, also going to be a part yeah. of the session. Yes, uh, welcome. So uh, this is actually one of the uh, one of the, the, the first webinar. Uh, we will plan the next ones. We can see it on the uh, on the you can actually uh, the next one will be on 17 of, of June. You can actually check out and get the info about uh, the next uh, webinars and event at Game Camp website and at uh, Google for Startups Campus a website uh, where actually you can see the uh, uh, the addresses here. And then, of course, uh, if we go uh, further, then uh, we have the uh, uh, the data related to uh, uh, Slido. Uh, Game Camp goes Slido, so. You are welcome actually to join uh, Slido uh, with, uh, with GameCam. Uh, so use that uh, application to add the questions, uh, join the discussion. You just go to the Slido website and then you, uh, you need to just go to the Slido dot, uh, website uh, and then enter the GameCamp as the name of the event and then you will be able to join the uh, discussion. And then going next, uh, we can actually uh, start uh, uh, like uh, very lightly. So actually you can check out uh, and maybe uh, we can actually check which, uh, which cities are you connecting from. So just uh, go to the uh, Slido and then join the the event and actually you can add uh, information which city which which place are you connecting from actually we see more and more actually people coming great to see it so we see actually the people from many many different places like prague warsaw bratislava krakow london uh, bergen riga Łódź, olsztyn rybnik uh, manila uh, Novi Sad, so uh, more and more Helsinki, Norway, uh, great to see actually uh, Copenhagen, Milan, Pirot, so great to actually uh, uh, see you uh, coming. Okay, so let's maybe uh, not uh, spending more time, uh, let's go further. Let's start with the first presentation. Uh, that is related to building BI system and analytics ca capabilities at the company based on the reality games example. So let me introduce uh, our first speaker, Adam Longcorn, uh, who is leading uh, all anal analytics activities at reality games. And he will be sharing his experience both on the uh, strategic and the operational and tactical side. He actually has experience developing uh, gaming and apps analytics system at his company. So, Dadam, the stage is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Let me know if you can't. Um, so, my name is Adam Longhorn. I'm the head of analytics at Reality Games. Uh, thank you very much, Marius, for that introduction. Um, I'm here to talk to you today um, about really making your life easier and delivering insight faster, which I believe is what all of us always try to do. Um, and the way we're going to do that today is by uh, simplifying your app analytics and reporting in just a few easy steps with Firebase and BigQuery. Okay. 
So before we actually get started, um, I do want to plug my company. So I mentioned um, I work for Reality Games, and we make free-to-play games based on real-world data from across the globe. Okay, so um, just to let you know, we are launching a new game this summer called Landlord Go. Uh, check it out. It's in most Android stores. So let's say before we get started, I want to ask you guys some questions. So if you can get your Slido uh, back out. And the question here is, how long does it take to perform a typical data analysis request from your team member? And based on my experience, I created these, uh, these categories, right? So sometimes a few days. Okay, we got one guy, four guys to answer, full day, ages. Yeah, a lot of them are ages, definitely. Let's see if the answers pour in, see how they pour in. I love Slido. Okay, so it looks to me that, you know, we've got a lot of full days and a lot of, you know, few days, so quite a long time. Okay, um, that's good to know. Let's maybe ask the second question, okay? If it's okay, let's skip, skip to the second question. Let's assume these things stabilize roughly here. When would your team member typically like to have their analysis request delivered, right? Would it be less than an hour? Would it be yesterday or would maybe it would be the day before yesterday? Okay, so I kind of set that one up obviously for you guys, um, you know, and I, it really kind of gave, uh, the reason I did this is it kind of gives us an intro that um, to this analytics world that, and it's what all the analytics guys really struggle with. Um, it's that the business moves really fast, right? It moves super fast and the business decisions move even faster. So our business, and I definitely noticed this when I joined uh, Reality Games last year, is that we have a ton of data from many, many different sources, right? But the problem here again is the business moves quick and a lot of that data is not readily available to support the pace, okay? And I was running into this problem where I was getting lots and lots of requests and I just didn't have the data on my fingertips. So what would typically be helpful, right, for guys like us, right, um, analysts or uh, even quasi-analysts, right, accessible data, right, at the appropriate granularity. That's really, really important. Simple data structures like tables that people understand conceptually um, are very important for analysts and quasi-analysts, and they need to be usable, right, easily usable. And the last one is that they, they must contain relevant metrics, uh, data points and dimensions that make it truly useful instead of just sort of a nice to have interesting data that you may not even uh, you know, um, access uh, very frequently at all. So I thought about it and I looked around. We had many, many tools, but I decided on basically three, right? So um, with our app, and I'm going to guess a lot of your guys' apps, you know, you'll have the Firebase SDK installed. So that's just Great start. Okay, the second one is BigQuery. BigQuery is really important. It's um, integrated with Firebase, and we're going to step through that in a second. And then, of course, there's going to be some SQL. So you will have to have, have you will have to know some SQL, um, which I do. So anyway, uh, the solution um, was what I designed uh, was called the Daily KPI Table, and it's intuitive. And I hope that you guys will fall, will will, uh, will find it intuitive as well. So it's an easy to use BigQuery table. Right again, tables are stuff that most people recognize pretty easily. It's granulated at the user and day level. So it summarizes for every user that logs into your app, it summarizes their day's activity. It covers, from my experience, 80% of uh, ad hoc analysis requests. I can use this table maybe uh, to query it directly or to subquery it or to join it with maybe one other data point or um, let's say data uh, data source, right, to deliver the insight that I need. And maybe a bonus, I call it a bonus, but maybe it's the biggest benefit. It really is connectable to Google Data Studio reporting, which we're going to cover in just a bit. So just to summarize before we get really into it, um, we're going to do three things. We're going to integrate BigQuery with Firebase. This assumes that we all have the Firebase SDK installed. If you don't, then certainly that this is a step that you're going to need to take with your team. But once you have, you can pick up from these steps, no problem. Then we're going to set up a SQL data pool in BigQuery and schedule a data extraction job. That sounds really complicated, maybe, to some people. 
Um, but uh, I'll show you, we'll have some step-by-step -step instructions and I will give you the code that's required to set up this SQL. Um, and then we'll, at last, we'll, we'll review what we've done and we'll have a few takeaways and final thoughts. Now to estimate this time commitment on your side, if, you were gonna, if you're gonna do this from home after the webinar, um, it's about 31 minutes, maybe. Maybe, this is just a guess from me on my side. Um, one minute to integrate BigQuery, or maybe less. A day to rest, and then 30 minutes to build and schedule the jobs. And again, this, is, this assumes that you're not terribly familiar with the BigQuery interface. So it's really, really easy to get this thing going. Right, so one last question on Slido, um, just so I know how and what speed I need to go at um, on the rest of this presentation. How familiar are you guys with Firebase and BigQuery? The first one is my company exports raw analytics events from Firebase. I use BigQuery regular to do analysis reporting, advanced user. My company has Firebase SDK installed to check analytics dashboards, but we do not integrate BigQuery yet. My company has Firebase SDK installed, but we've yet to use analytics features. You're a beginner level. Or what is Firebase? I thought this was the Cat Fancy webinar, which means you're probably in the wrong webinar, and that's unfortunate. Or maybe fortunate. Depends on what you get out of this. So um, really good news. It looks like we got a lot of BigQuery users, so that's really cool. Um, maybe one or two. Looks like one person may be in the wrong webinar. Um, so what I would probably guess is that we'll try to move through this fairly quickly. Again, the steps are all there, so we, you can go back and review everything. For the advanced users, um, there may be some tips and tricks that you guys might pick up on, and I, I really do hope so, um, that you guys might, might find this useful and maybe you'll reorganize some of your data. Uh, for the guys in the wrong, wrong webinar, um, maybe possibly you'll get something out of it. Um, hang on tight, uh, you, may, you may still learn something. Okay, so navigate to your Firebase console, right? I'm gonna move through this pretty quick, um, certainly for the advanced users, but we do have some intermediate and beginner users. Firebase console, click on your project. For us, you'll see Git rent all over this project. It's a beta test, uh, it's a beta game that we're running. Uh, you'll open up the window, go into project settings, then you'll go into integrations, and then you'll go to BigQuery, manage BigQuery. Okay, under here, you click on and toggle Google Analytics, right? Now what this does is it takes all of that raw analytics event data that Google, or sorry, that Firebase is reporting on their dashboard and it will start sending it to BigQuery and it will be put in these analytics events data sets. These are semi-structured tables, right? Now, one really important note is that it does not retroactively give you all that data, right, that you had for the last however many months, right? It just immediately starts the export. Okay, so sooner that you do this, the better, because then you can start actually keeping those analytics over time, or sorry, the, those uh, events over time. On a side note, there's many other things that you can also integrate on this page with BigQuery, Crashlytics, predictions, performance monitoring. So if you're willing to consume that, there's a lot more you can do. So right now, you've basically done the first step, right? You're now sending raw events data to BigQuery, and you've just opened up a huge world of possibilities. But, you know, what now? Well, as I mentioned before, it's time to really take a rest. And again, the reason behind that is that you just told Firebase to start exporting all of this data, and now you gotta give it a little bit of time. Now, um, depends on you know, a, lot of, a lot of factors, but you know, it could take a few hours to, for the first analytics events to take place. My recommendation is just wait 24 hours. Okay, just wait 24 hours, and then you'll be able to start this, um, the rest of this process. So let's assume you did that. Okay. And, you're, and you, you showed up tomorrow and you navigate to your Google Cloud platform. When you're there, you select your project and you scroll down for BigQuery. Okay. Once you've gotten there, you highlight your project. Again, here, Git Rent. You create your data set. You name it reporting, which is really, really important. And then you create your data set. Now, this is where I'm, I've given you guys um, a bit of the tools. I hope you can see there's a link down at the bottom of this slide. Um, it's a bit.ly link. Okay, um, yeah, there it is, it shows up. You go to that Billy link and you'll have the SQL to do the next step, okay? So you copy and paste that SQL into a text editor. You find the string analytics events data set and you replace it with your own analytics events data set. And you'll find that once you have your project sorted in your BigQuery window. It'll appear here automatically, right? And it'll look just like this, analytics, exit or whatever it is, one, two, three, four, five, okay? 
And then within that text, you replace every instance where you see um, less than analytics, events, data set, greater than uh, uh, text string. Okay, you do that for every, every place in the query. You clear your editor, paste the query in here, run the query, save the results, make sure you save it under the reporting data set name and your table name, daily KPIs, and then you save it. There's a second query that's very similar to the first. Okay, so you follow the exact same steps. It's a slightly different bit.ly link, so you can go to that link, but you do the exact same thing. You replace it, events analytics data set with your analytics data set for every instance, just like we did in the first query. This step though is slightly different. Clear the editor, paste the query in here, and then what you wanna go in here, you wanna, you wanna select this create new scheduled query step. This window will pop up and it's vitally important that you follow these directions, okay? So you can name it whatever you really want. I'd recommend daily KPIs extract. You set it on a one day schedule. Here in Central Europe, usually 10 a.m. works well. You can even do 11 to just be really safe and make sure that the analytics uh, events are there. Schedule it at 11 a.m. if you're here in Central Europe. Make sure your project is selected, which it should be. Make sure that you have a reporting data set Name it daily KPIs. This is very this is case sensitive. So again, make sure you get that right. And then you click append, which is very important. Okay, you guys know what that means, what append means. And then you schedule it. Okay. And now you've done basically all the hardest steps there is to this entire thing. And you're finished. But you may be asking me, what did I just do? What did I just create? In summary, what we've done here is we've scheduled a BigQuery job. And that job extracts these raw analytics events data from the previous day. So like in-app purchases, sessions, user info, first opens, which is kind of like an install, right? The SQL then transforms it and summarizes it, summarizes it for every single day at the user level, right? So every user that logs into your app, it'll summarize basically, you know, the platform that they're on, the country that they're from, how much money that they, that they uh, spent in your app, session information, right? And then on that daily extract, it'll append it to your daily KPIs table. So once you run through this, right? Once you run through this, every single day, it'll make this longer and longer history of user, uh, user behavior, daily user behavior. And to give you guys a little bit of a flavor, um, what it would create, um, the event date is already mentioned, a user pseudo ID, which is unique to Firebase. Um, it's a unique device on your app. The country that they're from, the platform that they're running in, how many sessions used that particular day, how many seconds they spent in your app in total, if they were a first open or not, so one in zero flag, binary, number of payments, if they made payments, if not, it's zero, and the amount of revenue that they generated in USD. I'm gonna stop right there for a second because it's really important to kind of absorb this at the moment and realize, and I'm sure it's certainly the guys that are familiar with the analytics, um, they realize that um, this simple data set is basically the core of a lot of the reporting that you would do um, for app analytics, right? DAU, MAU, ARPDAO, ARPU, installs, conversion rate, session information, all of that stuff can be derived from this particular data set. So I want to show you basically how this can, you know, that how this has just made your analytics in your life basically a lot easier. It certainly made my my life a lot easier. So here's just some simple examples, right, of, you know, queries that would typically take a lot more time if you just kept this data in this raw format versus using now your daily KPI table, right? So questions like, what was MAU by country in March? What was your ARPU in January? What was the average session length by platform? Or even something slightly more complicated, like what percentage of new users converted to payers uh, on D0, right, install date, in the first week of February? So you can see just by looking at some of this code, and I think, like I said, intuitively, you guys know that this would be a lot more complicated, right, if we didn't have this nice pre-prepared summary of our daily KPI at the right granularity. Second reason why this would make your um, life easier is because of a really beautiful, brilliant piece of um, uh, piece of software, or I guess application from Google called Data Studio, 
right? And all these tools and stuff from Google are just brilliantly integrated. So, and this is another one, right? So you've got your reporting daily KPIs on the, on the left-hand side, right? Well, you've got Data Studio, which is an, a very nice B, uh, BI application. There's integrations to a lot of different sources um, in Data Studio, one of them, of course, being BigQuery. Well, I would highly recommend if you guys are looking at developing reporting, as I said, I think this is probably one of the biggest benefits of this um, particular uh, daily KPI table is you can report on it. So I'd highly recommend um, going into Data Studio once you've created your daily KPI report, or sorry, daily KPI table, um, connect to, the, connect to the, your daily KPI table and start building dashboards. And you can see a small example of the dashboard on the right. These are all the metrics that I just mentioned to you before trended over time, right? And you, you, can even, you can have filters on the right by platform and country and, you know, event date, all these things, all in one really nice place. And this, I can tell you by practice, once we design this, our business uses this widely, right, to report on how our app is functioning. One page, all your key metrics. Lastly, um, last thing is, um, it really gives you the framework. It really gives you the framework to build a more sophisticated da uh, daily KPI table. So if you're familiar with SQL and you really want to kind of expand it, you know, really the the um, the sky's the limit on this, right? You can add more dimensions. Right now, for example, right out of the box, um, Firebase provides things like mobile device or brand or app version, um, where you can group and filter by. You know, of course, other user properties, you can um, design custom analy uh, custom user properties through Firebase that can get passed directly to BigQuery and you can build those in right to this, uh, this query as well and to your daily KPI table. Metrics as well, right? Custom um, analytics events, things like levels up and tutorial completes. You know, imagine, let's say, seeing all of your first opens. Not only do you know if they're a first open right now and if they've paid and converted, but you could also know if they've, let's say, completed the tutorial, right, with a one what a one zero flag, or you might be able to know how many level ups that they um, that they experienced in that particular day, or what was the last level, let's say, they they achieved on that day, right? This can all be appended right to your daily KPI table once you get familiar with some of that code. So that's that's really it, really. Um, it's really best to know that you know you can create something yourself. You can use this code that I've given you, and I would highly, highly recommend building on top of it to best fit your business needs, make your job easier and deliver insight faster. Thank you very much for your time today and uh, best of luck with everything. Adam, thank you very, very much for a very concise and insightful presentation. Uh, let's now turn uh, to a couple of questions uh, that we have from the attendees. Um, the first one being, how do you estimate the cost of using BigQuery? Okay, that's a. I think that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> um, I can I can only tell you from my own user experience, and I think also um, there's a presenter that's right behind me, uh, Martin. Um, I know he's actually addressed this in a previous game camp, so I may defer to him, uh, which would mean that we'd maybe leave this to the to the end of the session. But um, my experience is that especially if you're using just the events out of the box, right, and you don't use any custom events, and you know we were we we started running this particular um, we started running running our project one project that we have on Firebase, and at some stage we had maybe about a hundred thousand DAU something like that with basic events. Um, that was exporting with lots of screen views and everything. That was a, which was a, taking up a ton of space. That was exporting about five gigs of data a day. I think without any other custom parameters or, or anything, I think we were being charged around maybe $5 a month, right? Okay. Something like that. So um, again, this is just my experience. I've, I've not gone through any like really super sophisticated cost calculations, but I do not see BigQuery um, being cost prohibitive. Excellent. That seems like a fairly reasonable price um, uh, for, for your needs. Maybe let's take one more question. Um, and the question is asking whether you can get attribution data uh, on UAC campaigns in BigQuery. Oh, very good question. So um, this is one that I think that my guess is Google is still working on. Okay, so they do do some account attribution. Okay, and it gets passed through and you could use it. But what I have found is that there's a good chunk of your um, of the first opens of the installs that are basically not set or they're unknown. 
Okay, and Firebase. So, um, of course, for you UAC guy, for UA guys, um, you need, of course, as much detail as possible. Um, so, from my experience at this point, I mean, until possibly Google introduces, um, you know, better or more account attribution, you may have to use a third-party supplier for that, and then possibly just pass that data in um, and warehouse it in BigQuery, right, and combine it with some of this data that that, that I've mentioned before. Okay, and one last question. Um, assuming that some people already use BigQuery, what would be, in your uh, perspective, the next level, the next step on how to evolve what you've shown us today? Oh, um, yeah, so I, I, the, fir the first bit certainly is to get reporting, right? For sure, right? So, you know, there's some of the stuff there that I mentioned, you know, you don't really want to calculate, you know, MAU by month. You want your reports to read that, okay? So, um, you know, before you even move past any sort of sophistication, um, you really need to get a, a really nice solid baseline reporting that you know landed well in the company. The worst thing that you can do is spend a ton of time on building reports and then find out that no one uses them or very few people use them. So you'll have to iterate a bit, build the reports, talk to your team, make sure that they're using them, right? And then go from there, okay? The worst is just not having insight, right? Not knowing what's actually happening in your app. Okay, and I have actually one more question here. Um, are all people uh, in your company using the same reports? Yeah, we use the same tools. So um, we still use Firebase Console because um, you know it's still really handy. Firebase Analytics by itself is, is a really nice tool. Um, but um, within our within our company, we use, of course, the you know uh, Google Play Console uh, directly from the Google Play Console. We sometimes use Google Analytics for something that's a little more sophisticated. We'll go straight to the App Store as well for iOS information. But um, we have a set uh, set, let's say, company KPI dashboards, right? That I flashed up on the screen a few slides ago, and those particular ones are landed throughout the company. Um, they're split by app. So each of the apps teams can focus on their own KPIs. Um, so yeah, I think I, I addressed your question, right? So we have a yeah. set, 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 set tools that you know uh, the company uses. Perfect, Adam. Okay, thank you very, very much uh, for the presentation. Really appreciate you uh, having you here. Uh, and with that, I would pass the word um, to Martin uh, and Veet to take us uh, further with their presentation. Hello, everybody. Hi. From the I'd like to say sunny Prague, but actually it's pretty ugly today. And welcome to our second piece of the program today, which will be around custom mobile analytics and also not only custom, but cost efficient. Uh, for those of you who uh, were a part of my game camp presentation, uh, a big portion of this presentation is similar, but today I actually have a partner here, uh, which is Beat, the data engineer slash data analyst of a pageant who actually uh, build the whole thing. So there's going to be a part for you uh, where we're going to go much more in depth in terms of how the setup is actually being done on the inside. And I think it's going to be quite a nice extension of what Adam uh, basically just covered. So quick introduction. I'm the head of marketing at App Agent. Uh, lead here, as I mentioned, is the data engineer. And uh, why we are here talking to you, we built multiple custom analytics setup uh, for a couple of companies and also a couple internal tools, uh, both marketing and product, and kind of joining everything together with ASO data. And uh, working in an agency, we also have a pretty short learning cycle and real life connection into what people are actually using in the industry and what are kind of the pitfalls. And we'd like to share our experience today about how we approach building custom analytics and what is kind of the best way uh, that we landed on uh, when recommending custom tools for starters uh, for companies. App Agent, uh, just a shameless plugin. Uh, we are a mobile marketing agency and do a lot of stuff around mobile marketing. Uh, today, we're obviously going to focus on the analytics part. And what you're going to learn in this session, uh, basically, how does custom analytics creation look like from start to finish? So we're going to start on a, I'd say, high level, uh, discussing about what should be the parts of it, uh, then go into a case study where we're going to talk a bit about what are the building blocks of the analytics? And then I'll pass the word over to Veed, who's going to kind of dive in into how it's actually being done on the, on the inside. So uh, very quick intro about what and why. Uh, obviously, mobile analytics uh, 
it's it's a big word world uh there, there's a lot of different tools for basically everything different combinations it's really hard to pick a tool set if you're starting out or even if you're advanced because there's just so many options uh but from this kind of huge map of different tools for different purposes what we see on the market are kind of tools that are the most commonly used product analytics for understanding the behavior attribution understanding user source and kind of the performance uh in marketing analytics crm system for push notifications and stuff uh reporting tools which kind of push data together and actually give you some reports and dashboards aso tools and market engine market intelligence tools uh, which are more specialized tools um, in a sense that give you some, let's say, market aggregation insights or ASO aggregation insights, or specialized in a sense that you're using them for, for ASO. Out of these, what do we believe makes sense to actually integrate into your custom stack uh, are free. Product analytics means user behavior, marketing analytics, so which campaigns perform the best, and ASO analytics, uh, kind of understanding how your app performs in stores, what is what is the traffic distribution, uh, how reviews are doing, and some other metrics that you can only find in uh, uh, in platform consoles. So our kind of uh, mission here and what we believe is actually an added value, uh, and we don't see that in many, let's say, products on the market, is actually having a custom setup where you've got all of these connected together uh, in a unified reporting. Before we go into what we actually created and what we can recommend, uh, ideal setup. Well, in our opinion, it's all the data is one place. Basically, all of these free legs are in one place. You can leverage them together in one dashboard that can be customized. It's affordable in terms of the price. And for everybody who, who try to get uh, proper, uh, let's say, specialized analytics tools, you know, it's very, very expensive, very frequently, so affordability for many companies is a make or break type of a thing. Uh, User-friendly, uh, obviously everybody can use it from the company, from data analysts to CEOs, and ideally also customizable. Uh, the bad thing about it doesn't exist. Uh, usually you get three of these, but uh, not the last one, for example. And uh, that's just the way it goes. But this, as we're gonna discuss it, is kind of our shot um, at one point of, of the company's life cycle uh, where our kind of recommendations can be can be well leveraged. And this is the basic infrastructure when it comes to custom analytics uh, that we recommend for most people. Uh, first step, bring all the data together. And that means product analytics, in this case, it would be Firebase, uh, attribution data and uh, network data. In some cases, it can be also uh, at monetization data, subscription data. So basically all the data gets over API connectors transferred into some kind of a database, then it gets transformed and then visualized. Simple as that. So the thing is basically we're pulling everything into one place, into one database, and then do ETLs uh, on top of that. And what tools in general do we use? Uh, there's a couple of platforms that we can use. We are using Google Cloud Platform, uh, rather historically, I'd say. I think that similar things can be built uh, anywhere else, but uh, Google, Cloud Platform actually allows us like um, basically total freedom for a good cost. So in some cases, others might be better, but uh, we're kind of stuck with Google Cloud Platform and never had a reason to leave for groups elsewhere. Um, so that's kind of the introduction. Uh, we select the platform historically, but also works pretty well. Uh, we understand what data are we after. And now uh, if we use a general framework on a company could be a gaming company or an app company uh, how are we going to actually proceed uh, so in this part i'm going to guide you through a use case of a real life company which was we were approached by them to basically recommend them um, a custom solution and then build it so we're going to go basically step by step through the process and show you how we approached it and uh, in case you're thinking about doing something similar uh, there might be some points where you can inspire yourself uh, from, from our approach. Uh, so the client was uh, StudyCat, which is basically uh, language learning for kids, and it, it's a set of games for kids. Uh, and the task was recommend tools for and help uh, and help build a unified dashboard, uh, product, marketing, and ASO. So how do we approach it? 
Well, obviously, it's always about analyzing the needs. So in case we're thinking about custom infrastructure, like is it, is it even necessary? And uh, what are the needs? And there's many questions. It depends on what's your budget. If you're using already some tools, if you've got some data available, uh, how frequently do you need the data to be processed? Uh, can you do your own SQLs? What is the timing? What are your KPIs and the amount of used UA networks? So there, there's a lot of things that should be considered. So when thinking about custom analytics, this is just an example that there's many factors that go into it. And you really need to think about if such a setup needs to be custom, or if you are at a stage where you can basically be okay with a simpler setup, a simple reporting, or for example, just using the tools that are freely available before investing into building anything. So that's analyzing the needs. But in this case, it was basically clear that there was no other way than building the setup just based on the requirements of the client. So once we knew what was the goal, uh, we went to create an overview or an architecture of the whole tool. So as you can see, it kind of follows the previous schema uh, where we are starting with Firebase Analytics, uh, which is a data collector. And um, basically, it's free. It's great, not perfect, but events are easily dumped into BigQuery, and then you can do the magic. For attribution, uh, we ended up using Kochava, uh, but basically, it can be any tool that can provide you with raw data. I'm going to stop here for a bit. Uh, in case you want to do a, let's say, proper analysis, not only for your paid users, that means users from paid channels like Facebook and Google, but also for organics, you're going to have to have also raw data from the attribution provider for organic users. And it might be a problem. These are sometimes priced separately and cost some additional money. Uh, so selecting the proper plan uh, can have a big effect on the data availability. So just a note, take care. Uh, add network data uh, to put all the analytics data for marketing together. You need the attribution. You need partly the behavior. And you also need the costs and impressions and the part of the funnel that only lives on the ad networks. So you need to automatically download the data. We're doing that over API uh, and using a tool which is called Metillion. We'll get back to that later. And uh, yeah, in case Static Ad wanted to have more ad networks, we'd probably go for another tool, which would be an aggregation tool. Uh, we would not write the API connectors ourselves because this is just uh, much hassle or too much hassle. Uh, to manage it all. In their case, also, uh, the monetization was via subscriptions. Uh, so no need to write our own solution. There's actually uh, already existing tools on the market. can be from Revenue Cat or uh, I, don't, I don't remember the, the other services, but there's multiple of them. Uh, so in this case, they basically had to build their own solution, which pro proved to be very complicated. And in the end, it didn't work for a long time. So for those of you thinking about subscriptions, um, we definitely would recommend you to go with an existing solution and not try to build anything. Uh, it takes too long, too many exceptions, and uh, just not worth the hassle. Then besides the subscription revenue data, we also plugged in ASO data. And for that, we used AppFollow, which is once again another paid tool, which has a great API, and it throws daily reports from both stores. Uh, already kind of pre-processed into one place into our Google BigQuery cloud storage. Uh, as I mentioned, that's what we're using. Uh, ETL orchestration, uh, there's a tool called Metillion, which actually lives on the Google Cloud Platform. It runs on a virtual machine, and we're using that to do all the ETLs and kind of create the whole uh, data transformation um, and aggregation infrastructure. We will talk a bit more about that. I think it's a great tool. And once the data is pre chewed and transformed, we get to Data Studio for visualization, where we got three different views, product view, uh, where we've got dashboards for the most common metrics uh, that product, market, uh, product managers or CEOs are, are, uh, are interested in. Then there's the marketing for UA managers and um, marketing managers. And then the App Store view, uh, which can be used by ASO managers, but uh, honestly, for study gets reason, it was basically uh, the high level execs actually wanted to receive some uh, regular reports about how the app store is doing, uh, not to you know open three different tools and and check that, but uh, but have everything in one place. 
So this is kind of the setup that we recommended. And now, what are the costs? And I believe there was a question around that after Adam's first talk. So for Google BigQuery, uh, we actually created a calculation uh, and a calculation table where you input the amount of MAUs, uh, uh, how many events do you send, how many sessions are there per day or per month, and actually calculates the price for a year. So you can have a very high level understanding about how much uh, how much money you're going to be paying both for storage and both for transformations. So in case of StudyCat, who had 250,000 MAUs, they had where we predicted that uh, the costs would be around 2,000, uh, which still is some money, but they already have a quarter of a million of users. So uh, when compared to other tools, it's obviously night and day. So that just shows how cost effective the whole setup can be. Uh, for Metillion, uh, there is actually a nice hack. Uh, the tool is being paid uh, for an hour. So that's $1 per hour. But uh, we don't need that to run for a whole day because we are batch processing it. We are batch processing the data. So it always gets only turned on once a day for one hour. And uh, it processes basically everything. And then it's being shut off. So we're just paying for one hour. And then the attribution partner, that definitely like depends on what plan do you have. In case of Kochava, there was, at the time, an offering for $100 uh, getting for raw data for both paid and organic. Uh, and uh, yeah, we decided to go for that. Uh, we're not really happy with Kochava, but uh, uh, that's that's just our recommendation probably uh, to stick to AppSlyer or Adjust, which we've got pretty good experience with. Um, and there was no hassle. Uh, there was a lot, lot of differences when it comes to Kochava implementation. So, so we decided to drop it for future projects, even though they've got this wonderful offering in terms of costs. And now really quickly about if we now uh, have the infrastructure kind of in place, how do we proceed? So we define events. Uh, we collect everything from the product standpoint. So we create a table, define, uh, I'd say, pretty, pretty in detail about what events are there going to be, uh, what parameters are there going to be. And we have a perfect understanding about what's actually being uh, sent into the BigQuery. Then on top of these raw events or events and definitions, we build a set of metrics and dashboard definitions uh, where we really take care about how the metric is defined. And there can be many ways how you define even the core metrics. Like, you know, what, what event is the retention based on? Or what is a session and what is session length? Uh, so our approach is to always very carefully define how is that thing being calculated, decided on the beginning before obviously the data is ETL'd and included into the whole setup. So for each metric, uh, we basically define how exactly it's going to be calculated. Uh, and we're very rigorous in this in this process, I'd say. Uh, and we also have a table for dashboard, so we kind of lay out what we actually will need, discuss it with stakeholders. This is super important, and like minimize the amount of views that will be included in the end in the dashboard. Because uh, as everybody who try to report or create dashboards know, the needs are limitless. But eventually, it comes to a point where people just uh, are overwhelmed and, and don't use it at all because of all the clutter. So this is an extremely important step just to define things so, so people have an easy time uh, using it. So it's kind of the process from defining events, uh, defining metrics on top of these, and defining dashboards on top of the metrics. Then implementation and testing, that's basically on the developer team. Can't stress enough the importance of testing. Always something gets fucked up. So it's really like super necessary uh, for the developers to be extremely rigorous. And then once everything is defined and there's a plan for everything and it's implemented, then comes the time for the ETL setup where the data is being taken, the raw data from different tools, which are so far on one big pile, totally unstructured. The data is taken and actually transferred into something that's actually usable and useful. And I'll let Vite take from here and talk a bit more about how this process works in our case. <clears throat> yes, and, uh, we use uh, Matlion for batch processing. Uh, uh, I can compare it to, to the Google Fusion. Uh, I think it's a new tool from Google, which is quite similar. Uh, we use it because it's a nice uh, visual tool for uh, connecting data, and it also uh, has uh, API connectors uh, for uh, networks we need, or we can uh, write our own, uh, our own scripts in Python. Uh, to create uh, and the connectors we need. 
or uh, do some magic which can't be done uh, by the material itself. So uh, uh, as was said, uh, it, it uh, lives on the um, virtual machine, uh, which is uh, run once per day because we are using just a batch processing and so we're looking for uh, data from yesterday, not real time processing because of, as, as we think it's not so necessary. So uh, this is how it looks like inside. Uh, th this is uh, the like the main funnel uh, where the whole magic happens. Uh, I call it orchestration master, which is uh, actually run once per day. And uh, I will uh, guide you through uh, through it a little bit. Uh, the, the first part which uh, runs uh, at first is uh, with, uh, is downloading all data uh, from different data sources. It's uh, from uh, Coachella and uh, then from uh, marketing uh, well, ad networks. Uh, to get data about marketing. Uh, this is how it looks like uh, inside. Uh, Sadika has uh, like uh, five applications, each for uh, iOS and uh, Android. So 10 uh, applications as all. So that, that's, uh, that's the reason why it's so wide. Uh, the, the, the main part uh, uh, when we have all data uh, is here like uh, data transformation. Uh, uh, where we take uh, data uh, from Firebase uh, for uh, from each app and combine it together, uh, unnesting uh, like uh, nested fields and uh, connecting data uh, together, uh, which is uh, visible here. Uh, we are connecting attribution data and uh, data about uh, subscription. Uh, so, so, so that's the whole magic where we combine all data and then we can do uh, whatever we want from from this uh, big table uh we break it break down uh this massive table uh by each event and we store each event in separate tables it's uh because of the uh usually when you want to calculate some kpi uh it's j just about one event or you can combine two events uh, so you will just join tables and when you have a separate tables, uh, it's like BigQuery uh, can scan it faster and uh, also you pay uh, much lower. So this is how it looks like. Uh, that, as you can see, there are like uh, many boxes. Each is doing uh, something a little bit different, but uh, we don't have time to uh, describe it uh, at all. Yeah, and, and, and the, the, the last part uh, is just about um, because Firebase can uh, get that, uh, data uh, three days old because someone uh, wasn't uh, available on internet. So, so we are uh, like processing again uh, four days old uh, tables to get all data. Yeah, and uh, finally, when everything's done, uh, I get uh, like uh, report uh, about the uh, status of this ETL, if everything uh, works, uh, went well or not. Yeah, and the last part is visualization. Uh, what we did in Data Studio, as you can see, uh, we have like uh, daily, uh, weekly, monthly active users. We have uh, retention tables there, uh, marketing tables, or also we built uh, uh, easy uh, funnels. And just to add to the material part, um, I think that one of the greatest advantages of the tool is it's visual. So in case you've got multiple data sources, you've got multiple apps, uh, it's it's kind of easy and pretty concise to just understand what's going on. Uh, and I think that it's like a natural step uh, to what Adam showed, uh, or the next step from, from what Adam showed, which you can do in BigQuery. You can also schedule things, for example, uh, which is a great start, but eventually if you go into something much more complex, uh, probably it's a good time to implement some kind of a tool, uh, for example, Metillion, uh, which can uh, bring more structure into the whole process. And uh, picking up on the visualization part, uh, this is kind of also showing the filters is basically really dependent on what you've got in the tables, right? So what we're using that might be useful for somebody like the filters, which are which which we're mostly using for dashboards, app version, app name if you've got multiple names, uh, devices, UA channels, platforms, countries, subscription status. So it's basically just the default stuff that gets used the most often. You can add whatever you want into that, 
Uh, but as an inspiration, this is this is the most common stuff. And for marketing dashboards, it was a different dashboard than the product one, which you've seen on the previous page. And you can see that we've got this page for high level stuff, where if you want to check the performance in general, this is where you go. And then we always build like a second dashboard, which goes into these things in more detail. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we can do about how we're actually uh, using the dashboard to analyze stuff, but it's probably a topic uh, for, for another talk. Uh, just one last note about Data Studio. It went a long way in the past months or years. And from a tool that was uh, free, but very useful and usable, I think it's now at a very nice point when there's a lot of stuff that was not uh, possible before, but it actually allows you to build a proper reporting there. Uh, so yeah, for, for the pre-price and for the wonderful integration with Firebase and BigQuery, uh, I think it's just a, a wonderful tool. and. Uh, yeah, shout out to Google for, for providing us with that. Um, one last one that I'm going to end with. Custom analytics, is it really the best solution? Uh, in our, let's say, session uh, today, we showed you how we think about analytics, what's what's really important for most companies, and like the step-by-step, -step, how, you, how you kind of build uh, the thing, how you plan for it, and how it looks like uh, in the end. It can be a wonderful solution for some people, uh, definitely not the best solution for others. It really depends on your, your budgets, your requirements, the size of the team. Uh, so take this as kind of an inspiration. If you're thinking about it, uh, this might prove to be uh, an interesting input. For us, what we've seen why people actually go with custom is number one, because of the pricing. Uh, you're basically investing some money or some time in the beginning to build it. But then uh, the costs for just maintaining it uh, are incomparably lower. And uh, the second thing, if the company grows and you get to a point where uh, the standard of the shelf tools are extremely expensive, which can be pretty fast, or where you just need custom because uh, there's so many teams and you get your own BI team and stuff, uh, then basically that's the other point where, where we see companies kind of deviating from, from the off-the-shelf stuff and getting into custom. Uh, so it's up to every company to like diligently uh, figure out whether this is something that they can do and whether that's something that actually makes sense from these perspectives. So uh, thank you for your attention. Once again, our pictures from the time where we actually were young and beautiful and Corona did not prevent us from having haircuts. And uh, Q&A time. If there are any questions, uh, we'll be happy to. Marius, I think you're muted. Thank, thank you, Martin and Vit, for the for the great presentation. Yeah, uh, yeah. And there is a, like a, a few questions. One is actually like building on uh, what you like mentioned at the end, which is like limitation. What what is like you know, in your opinion, the main limitation, uh, the main challenge in using such uh, approach, or like for which type of companies you you think it's not uh, like you no know, really the best approach. Mm -hmm. I think it really depends on the team. Uh, what's wonderful about this setup uh, is super easy, easily accessible. But what's the downside? Well, basically, if you create it, it's kind of static. So in case you want to create different dashboards, uh, you want to adjust it. And depending on how it's set up, uh, there might have to be uh, a data engineer that actually like uh, adjusts the ETLs and stuff. So if you want a self-service tool and you've got many analysts, then probably uh, this is not the best solution if you're doing frequent analysis. So think about mm -hmm. it as really as a reporting tool, but not mm -hmm. an analytical tool. Uh, if you want an analytical tool, probably some in-memory type of a tool or you know stuff like that would be uh, would be better from the product standpoint. I think that the biggest advantage is really having all the data in one place from all areas. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that in case you want to go deeper, uh, this will allow you to do that. So that's, in my opinion, the biggest limitation. You have to have an analyst who really like uh, like to write SQLs. <laughs> Thank or you you for just have to have a perfect idea in the beginning. Like, in case you know what you're looking for, then basically 90% of stuff, for example, app companies want can be included in the dashboards from the beginning. But if it comes to gaming companies and like deeper analyses of monetizations and stuff, uh, this can not be. Uh, an ideal solution. 
Thank you for the answer. There is one question with the most votes uh, reg regarding the beginning of the presentation where you had all of the different logos uh, on the screen. Uh, and the question is around how do you control the data flow when it goes through so many different stages? Uh, and how do you um, uh, look at any potential errors that might uh, happen as a result of this? Yeah, um, you, you can check if Metal has uh, uh, possibilities how to check if you downloaded the right data. You can do some assert uh, assertions or uh, fallbacks when something went wrong. So that's something we, we handle uh, in Metalium. So it's usually not an issue that you'll be losing, for example, some data along the way. There are, there are many issues, I would say. And sometimes just the tools don't work or they don't give you the data. And uh, the, for example, if, as we showed, there was like a whole section of like fallback for the Firebase data, because sometimes it just comes, you know, two days later. And that's what we didn't know in the beginning. So obviously, if you have a system, uh, it's kind of a lot of trial and error uh, before you take care of all these exceptions. And it's why actually we showed like how, you know, there, there's there's many boxes in there. And a lot of these uh, have a lot to do with data control and just um, give you uh, or drop you a message if something is wrong. So the data is being checked before it's processed. That's basically this is a simple answer. Still, mistakes can happen, but uh, that's just uh, that's just a troubleshooting of the whole process and of the whole system. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much uh, uh, for the answer. Like there was the question, uh, like a few people will ask about this Kochava, why you were not really happy with that. What was the challenge? Well, the answer it. <laughs> he was the one. Uh, feeling the pain. Uh, we had a problem with Facebook attribution. Like uh, they lost a lot of data comparing uh, our ex with our experience with AppSlider or Adjust. Also, their APIs uh, are not uh, like uh, really friendly to use. Okay. Really, take it as our own opinion. It doesn't mean that Coachella can't work for you. And for example, their pricing is is super friendly. Uh, mm -hmm. So definitely, like. Uh, welcome you to to give it a try in case pricing is an issue it can really be super competitive uh just from from our or for us uh it was it was a lot of hassle just trying to make it work mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you very much for the uh for the presentation i like you know uh let's stay with us of course uh we'll have some you know short discussion in the in the end as well so uh, let's welcome to the stage uh, our next speaker, Michal Gno, who is head of uh, marketing analytics at Pixel Federation, and and he will sharing uh, his experience about data science uh, behind behind user acquisition and how actually are doing that at the uh, Pixel Federation. Hello, hello. Let's get the presentation ready. <clears throat> Okay, I have to check something first. Okay, maybe refresh will help the situation. In the meantime, uh, I'd like to, uh, thanks for introduction, Marius, and also thanks for previous amazing two, two amazing speakers. Uh, it was really really insightful, and as you noticed, both of both of guys actually using are, are using Google Google infrastructure and Google Google tools and in Pixel Federation a company based in Bratislava uh, uh, we are making uh, mobile free-to-play games currently there's around 230 people uh, working in pixel and we are as I mentioned before focused primarily on mobile free-to-play and we decided to to go with a different approach. And what I mean by that, I'll show you a little bit later in the presentation. And uh, the topic of this presentation is data science behind UA, but I put the science in quotation marks uh, for a reason. The reason is it's going to be more about mobile measurement and uh, handling the data and showing the right data to right people and less about the actual machine learning and predictive analytics that 
the title would uh, actually might think some people think that's that is about. And I'm also using Slido for this presentation, so feel free to ask uh, questions when whenever something is not clear. And let's start with a quick uh, quick poll. And my question to you to, to you guys is: How confident are you in mobile marketing measurement? And the reason being, uh, I don't know, like what's the actual structure of the audience, and it would be great to have a little bit. Some results are coming in, and so far it looks that most of you are quite confident. And since actually you are data analyst as I am, <laughs> and okay, okay, it's a little bit leveling up, and we have a nice spectrum. But it's good that there's nobody who was hearing it for the first time in his life. So you are the right webinar. And yeah, there's nobody who consider, considers, okay, <laughs> it's changing slightly, but there's nobody who considers him an expert in everything and nothing can surprise him. That's good because we are learning every day and, and in this environment especially, it's uh, really dynamic and things change over time. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll try to be as, uh, I'll try to present it in a way that everyone gets something out of it, since there's many of you guys who don't have don't have many uh, experience in this. So let's follow up. Okay, so I think everyone heard about this inequality, and it's one of the things that uh, about is important for our business. It's actually important for any business uh, whatsoever. So, uh, but. There is an asterisk, asterisk at the end uh, for a reason. It doesn't have to be always true if your business model or some of the factors that we'll talk about later. Okay, I'll have another question for you after this uh, slide. So, data and marketing. I guess there are like many different approaches how to how to get to. Data. First of them, of course, the most dumb uh, in a way is doing marketing without any data just spending just getting some budget spend it somewhere and hope for the best but it's not the wisest choice to do so uh, the second option is of course when you are when you have the budget and you want to run campaigns for example on google or let's say facebook uh, one of the biggest ones uh, you check the reports that are predefined in the in the ads managers and you kind of get the idea how things work and yeah, it's it's when you want to be more uh, more thorough, you can buy a third party tool or use the MMP, the mobile measurement partner, as mentioned in previous presentation, uh, AppsFire Kuchava, and check the data there so we can compare different uh, different uh, media sources uh, together. And the last one is building your own marketing analytics. These two presentations, and but this comes at a price, of course. It's not easy. It's time consuming, and uh, depending on on the technology you use, uh, it doesn't have to be the most. Okay. So the question now is: From which of the previously mentioned categories describe your? So I, I would assume that the first one uh, is not so relevant for you guys since you're on this webinar, but let's get some answers uh, ready. Answers already. Great. I guess, okay, we have eight answers. Let's get 10 more. So we have a like more significant uh, sample. And I guess it stabilizes. So most of you guys are checking actual reports within the Google or Facebook. Then second best is the using some third party tool and least amount outside of the first one, the first uh, category are using their own marketing analytics. So I guess uh, this session will be interesting to you as well. Uh, for all of you guys, we'll show you the approach that we are using. Uh, 
Okay, so what's the today's agenda? First, we'll talk about the basics. Then I'm going to present you our BI stack, so how it's different from uh, what, for example, Martin uh, or Adam were talking about. Uh, and at last, I'll show you how we approach actual, how the dashboards look like and what kind of data we put. Okay, so basics. When a person comes to the mobile marketing or any marketing measurement uh, world for the first time, it can be quite overwhelming. There are so many different abbreviations, different uh, KPIs that you can look at and can be really difficult to, to understand what's Uh, okay, so uh, I've come across an interesting article on uh, uh, mobile dev memo from Eric Seufert, who categorized the different metrics into two, three, into, into three segments. First of them is uh, regarding metrics that come to the like the acquisition side, and basically they are connected with uh, the, and with the cost side of things. So there you have all the metrics regarding like the cost per install, cost per action, CTRs, and so on. Then after the uh, person installs an app, it goes into the, like the engagement bucket where they measure different uh, metrics that take into account the activity, their payment behavior, their engagement. Uh, here you have all the metrics like ARP DAO, LTVs, and so on. And after that, after the second bucket, like after the engagement phase, when the player churns, there's a part of metrics that are relevant for the engagement, the re-engagement, getting back the player back and actually measuring the impact on their uh, LTV. And all of this is aggregated to a different traffic source. And, and uh, and 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 of course, like it's the diversified device between different media sources, different campaigns. So you know which of the actual media sources works the best for you. And but in Pixel Federation, we decided to to went on a different uh, approach. And but it's really similar, and we got quite inspired by by this uh, by this article. So at the first uh, point, you have the traffic source and you are measuring the cost side of things. So every single metric that you've seen in the slide. And uh, most, like one of the most important ones for us is of course the IPM, like how many installs you get from sessions and CPI and also like or per payer or return user. After that, when a player installs the game, we look at the retention metrics. So we look at the day one retention for the specific cohorts. We look at how many players uh, completed the tutorial, uh, how many players finished number of quests and so on. So we get an idea how the players play the game. And at last, and but not least, the monetization part is the part that actually um, able a, enables us to spend more money. And uh, when we get the, the reason being, yeah, to actually, uh, to business model to work, we need money to actually invest in you know, the new traffic sources. And it's important to uh, to measure them the, also the, in our case, it's all the, all the standard metrics. Also, we added a score metric, which actually translates to predicted one year return on ad spend that is one that uh, we look at the most when we. Okay. So I hope you have better understanding what metrics are relevant for each of these steps of M funnel, and let's dive into the the basic setup. And the basic setup would look like this. Okay, you have an app that you want to uh, market in one of the two most important play stores. It's either the Google Play or or store. Then you pick a you pick a, a network or a media source that actually is interested interesting to you, 
it might be the Google Ads or Facebook or any of the ad networks that are available. Of course, when you are doing mobile marketing, you need mobile measurement partner. You can't do it without it. As also Martin mentioned in the previous presentation, you need that, you can't build it on your own. And here are just a couple of the biggest ones. We are using AppSfire, but you can use uh, mobile measurement partner uh, you want. It, dep it depends on the size of your company and the budgets that you have. The last thing, you need some sort of reporting. You can do it either in the mobile measurement partner, or but it's much better to 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 dive deeper into the into the data, into the performance by using it in, in any of the BI tools that are available uh, in the market. And you can obviously you can do it even in Excel, or you can, for example, I I mentioned AppSumer here, uh, who does the whole reporting and ingestion of the data for you and. It's quite a nice tool to use as well. Okay, so these are the basics. And if you have this ready, you can start running campaigns and measuring you know, the performance of your campaign. But uh, that's another approach that we've uh, figured out in, in Pixel. Since the company is quite large and, and uh, we already have some resources, we decided to, to build our own uh, BI stack. And uh, this is how it looks like. It can look quite uh, uh, quite difficult or quite uh, cluttered at the first time, but uh, let's wait for a while. I'll explain different parts. But the main main part is we, we didn't build it on, on on cloud platform like Google or Amazon or whatsoever. It was built a while ago when we actually had our games in our own data data uh, warehouse. And we decided to build it on Hadoop and Apache Spark. So that's where we are at right now. So in the beginning, there's the tracking. So for this, we are using uh, Kafka as an, as an, as a, and stream sets for, for actual ingestion of the events. And then we staged it into Avro data layer. And currently, we are tracking around 1 billion of uh, events. And more than 40% of these uh, events is actually used for calculating regular reports on a daily basis. So a large amount of data is one of the reasons why we actually form. And actually, it's around 600 gigabytes of data. And also, we are just ingest, ingesting uh, different APIs. Uh, from Facebook, AppsFlyer, for example, Google Ads, and so on, and it's more than 17 of them every single day, uh, all by our, uh, by our own. But as Martin mentioned in the previous presentation, it was quite a difficult task to do, and it can, be, it can be difficult when the APIs update on a regular basis, but uh, it's a way that we chose to do so. Now it's kind of working, so uh, we are... Then the middle part is all about processing, so getting the raw data and making sense out of them. And uh, with this, we are using Spark and Apache Airflow to schedule the jobs. And and current setup, we are running around 4,100 uh, jobs uh, every day. And after the compression, uh, since we are not storing the raw data and, and the raw, uh, raw state, we compress the data and store only like 50. And for the analysis, there are eight analysts that are actually uh, the data using Spark or any actually any uh, language uh, to what, what they want, basically. And at last, there is a feedback loop to the APIs. So we are actually sending back events to Facebook and AppSpire to for optimization purposes. We are running Power BI from Microsoft to for dashboards and reporting, in-house reporting, and also we are running like custom apps when uh, when it's needed, like in, in this case for uh, marketing purposes. And then also we are running some of the, some recommendation and uh, other some like recommendation engines and other machine learning to feed back data to to our games. So. Current phase is around 
20 million uh, events. Third parties like AppSlayer and more than 100 uh, reports. And the cost was one of the things that was the decisive factor why we chose a Hadoop cluster over a different infrastructure, but it might change in the future with the cloud capability. So we'll see what the future holds. Okay. So finally, we arrived at the end of the UA and doing it in the smart way. What I, what I mean by that actually is this inequality that was mentioned uh, in the beginning. Calculating the cost per cost of acquisition is quite You get players from mobile after attribution, you get a cost from any of the ad networks you are using, and you just divide it and you know what a specific cost. But measuring LTV, it's not as easy. I'm going to dive into too much detail with this LTV uh, stuff since uh, the next game camp is going to be only about this or mostly about the metric. But just keep it, uh, just keep it uh, short and informative. LTV is lifetime value of the player. In this case, lifetime is, a, is not as uh, defined as the actual lifetime of a player for us, but more as a period, specified period of time. And usually this period is defined as a time frame where you want to regain the costs that you invested into the campaign. And there are many different methods that can be used for, uh, for measuring or predicting the LTVs. And currently we are at like the normalized ARPA curves. This is where we are now. And my question to you guys is what kind of method are you using to measure LTV? It would be nice to, to hear about like different approaches. I've added like the last point is an learning and but but like more sophisticated methods uh, mentioned above previously. Thank you. Let's see answers. I've Apple curves. Okay, okay. Now uh, it's good that everyone knows what the LTV is. Of course, I mentioned it in the previous slide, but I guess most of the most of you guys are using either historical revenues. Yeah, that's that's a good approach when you know how valuable the cohort for you is for from specific country, for example, or network. Retention method is quite useful. Yeah, that's one of the most used. As well, we've experimented with it and actually using it on for some purposes as well. And I can see ARPA curves are used less and less. So the historical revenue is the most most used right now. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to explain just a little slightly about the normalized ARPA curves, or you can call it also the return on aspen curves. And what I mean by that is, is this. We've specified the, the lifetime, in our case, for one year, but we are experimenting uh, currently with different time periods. But just to keep it simple, uh, this is how it looks like. So the normalization basically means it's normalized to one. So we are actually use, uh, looking not at the absolute values for uh, the LTV, but the ROAS itself. For example, in this case, the point 0.90, on this chart actually represents the 90-day ROAS benchmark that we want to achieve. So for example, on the top top side, there is like the TSM on Android and the ROAS benchmark for, for this specific project and platform that we are using as a combination uh, is 67%. So if it's below, we are actually not getting our money back. If we are above, we're expecting it to be uh, higher. And the calculation, is, as I mentioned, it's done from uh, historical data because that's the only thing we have available. And we, we do it for project and platform. Day, day one, day 364. And then we make basically the prediction, like how the average should look like one year time. And just to, make, just to put it into a different perspective, the ROAS benchmarks actually that 
are usually and they are like commonly used in uh, so this is for example how it looked like uh, uh, for these I chose for this presentation but this is the, this is the actual logic behind the whole prediction. Nothing fancier, it's just this. And uh, the advantages of this, it's just basically it's easy to calculate, it's easy to implement and interpret, inter interpret because it's and everybody understands how money works. And it kind of works when you have sufficient enough uh, sample sizes, but there are many cons to this. And it is like it's unstable over time when we have a major change in, in the game. We need to be really careful how the the multipliers change. And it's really inaccurate, inaccurate with small samples where you have only a couple of pairs, and especially when there is a payer who pays a lot. So it's easily fooled by so-called whales. And also, this doesn't solve uh, the problem of predicting the revenue for a specific player. It just takes the cohort level basis. And also can be unreliable with early predictions based on the things that actually happen uh, within the game at a specific time. Okay, so, and the final part, I, I promise, this is the really final part. So after the whole uh, ingestion, processing, and everything, how do we present the data to you, to, in this case, the UA managers, because it's the area of expertise and okay so basically it looks like looks like this so this is the tool that ua managers use uh on every single day i know it's uh it's a lot of things to digest but bear in mind it's uh i'll i'll show you really quickly how it, how it actually looks so on the first thing it's really important to have a clear naming structure so you know where are you running your campaigns which network are you using what is the targeting that you are using optimization and so on so this is on the left-hand side. Then we have the basic metrics that I mentioned before, uh, taking into account the CPI, spends, revenue, and so on. So UI managers know the, all the basic stuff about the campaigns. Then uh, the one of the most important parts or the, the crucial parts is to know what is the performance in terms of the prediction and also the profitability in the long run. So therefore we present the UI managers with the performance, the overall performance, but also the most recent performance, like for example, for the last seven days, 14 days and so on for the specific campaigns, because we need to know when the campaign uh, performance drops soon. So we need, so we can make the optimization and, mm, or cancel the campaign altogether. And, of course, there is an availability to, to look at the charts for specific uh, metrics. And also, we, we look at the uh, custom engagement metrics like the retention and uh, also tutorial completion and, and stuff like that. But the problem with this is that you can't, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. And we look at it at a deep, deep level, on a campaign level, you don't really have the big picture. Uh, what's going on if the performance increases or decreases over time. And therefore we've built like custom dashboards to, to specifically for, for this. So one of the things that anybody in the company can see is look at the performance for, for the specified period, like, like, let's say last month and, and transparently provide information about the, uh, the recent performance. Uh, important part as well is to look at trends and to see different metrics over time, how they change, if the CPIs increase if or decrease over time and so on. And of course, different slice and dicing of, of the data so people can uh, identify places where they can improve or places where there is a potential to grow. And my question to you guys, once again, and this is the last one, and also this is a multiple choice question, is so we can choose more than one. And what level of granularity is the right one to look at? 
when you look into the data. Now go also with the results right away. I have one answer so far. Three, six. Nice. It's kind of getting, yeah, I get, I think I, we have the most of the, most of the answers, uh, right now. And, and the thing is, uh, any of them is <laughs> good to look at. And it depends on the question you want to get answered when you are managing, when you are trying to optimize one single campaign, of course, campaign level is nice, but when you are running it, for example, on Google or Facebook, you can go even deeper on ad set level or ad level. When you are running uh, campaigns that are uh, run on multiple on clusters, like on multiple countries, you want to know which country in the cluster brings you value and which one is not so, so uh, not so eligible. And for example, when, when you are trying to evaluate creatives and let the, only the best creatives uh, to run, then also breaking up the data onto the creative uh, level, it's a really good thing. And for the optim optimization type, it's going not deeper into granularity, but but above. You want to know like which type of uh, optimization, either it's on an app event or value, brings you the most value. So in this case, all the answers are correct. But thank you, thank you very much for for the insight as well. So and the right level of granularity is the key. And in this case, we decided to to get all the data we need, all the data we have available and present them to the UA managers. So for example, in this case, Facebook allows us to, to go as, as deep as ad level. So it's a thing that, that our UA managers uh, look at every single day and optimize uh, the campaigns. Uh, we also look at the different, uh, we aggregate data also on different levels, like for example, in this case, on the optimization side. So Mm, clustering and categorizing campaigns into the optimization based on purchase value, ROS, and so on. And also for creative pers perspective, for creatives and, and the guys who are actually creating the assets that we are running on, on social media, it's good to know what kind of creatives uh, work the best for a specific audience, for specific geo, for specific optimization. They want to know like, what are the actual benchmarks that they are uh, trying to achieve and actually surpass them. And I can't forgot to mention one thing that was, uh, that's kind of a tricky to uh, not evaluate, but uh, to look at, and it's the relationship between marketing and viral. And this is the thing that is also really important on any state, the stage of your product and to look at the, let's say, viral effect of the campaigns that you are running on any of those, uh, any of the ad networks. And it's why we are looking also at the performance over time. And we want to basically see whether the increase in uh, marketing activity increases also the viral effect and the uh, revenue that is coming from viral pl players or, or organic players, uh, if you want. And uh, I guess that's about it, actually. So I'd like to summarize the presentation. It was a little bit longer with some uh, hiccups in the tech. I'm really sorry about it. With the data, it's always garbage in, garbage out. If you have to get data right, you have to have a good quality tracking. Uh, you have to be sure that, that what you actually look at is correct. Otherwise, all the insights that you are going to build are, are basically worthless or can mislead you. Uh, building everything in-house is not easy at all. It took us quite a lot of effort, uh, time, money, and actually years to get where we are uh, right now. And, but for some companies, it just makes sense. Uh, third point, it's uh, shout, it's uh, for all the data analysts, give UA managers all the tools they need to make the right decisions. So when they want to see breakdown to countries, 
they know why why they want it, and actually, in this case, it helped in quite helped them quite a lot to optimize clusters and cluster campaigns into different geos. Uh, well, one of the last points is the measuring LTV is kind of difficult, but the topic today wasn't about the LTV. It will be the next game camp, but it's good to start with something. So historical revenues, it's totally okay. It's better to do some sort of predictions. Retention RPDAO method, it's quite, quite, uh, quite good and actually sufficient for, for most of the cases. But you get, you need to know soon enough whether a campaign is profitable or not. So LTV is the king. And last slide that I mentioned, LTV, this inequality is not everything since some projects or even some campaigns can bring a lot of viral effect that can actually bring the product itself from negative numbers to positive numbers and can be eventually in the long run profitable even though the campaigns itself themselves don't look that way. So that's, this sums it up. Thank you for attention. And now it's time for the Q&A. Michal, thank you so much for a very detailed presentation. I think we've heard uh, most of it. Uh, so don't worry too much. <laughs> Two questions for you. Uh, the first one being, um, have you seen any effect on manually setting countries for UA campaigns? Should Facebook and Google machine learning do that for you? Actually, we currently, like we were running multiple like worldwide campaigns where we didn't restrict the uh, geos whatsoever. So we would like assume, we would assume that, that we would get really good traffic from, from like when we, for example, optimize to, towards purchases, uh, that we would get uh, good quality traffic. But it wasn't always the case. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. What actually worked for us the best was actually like isolating a country, like when it's, for example, the US. It's large enough to run actual specific campaigns to towards US or clustering different geos together based, for example, on their CPAs. Yeah, that's one of the things that we are still and quite still running on Google ads, for example, and quite, quite uh, with really good results. So. OK, and one more question for me. Um, how accurate is your 12 month uh, lifetime value prediction? And why don't you pre um, um, predict more into the future? We, we are predicting more as well. We are working on uh, integrating it into also on all our tools. So we are currently experimenting with 18 months and, and two years. But it's tricky for new products when it's not in the market uh, for more than a couple of months. So it's just, you would call it a wild guess <laughs> in this case. But even the one year prediction when you have only three year, three month old product, it's, mm. you just need to look at the numbers every single day and, uh, and correct the predictions uh, regularly to get the right answers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And maybe one more question uh, from me as well. I see the question like, uh, if you have s system like like yours, how difficult in this case is to add new metrics or like new stuff from other partners? Uh, how actually challenging in that is? Uh, for already integrated partners, like let's say we already integrated Google Ads API, it's quite easy. It's just like because the connection is already there, so it's just about adding adding new either calls to the API or adding a new metric when we want to add that. Uh, for new partners, it's it can be difficult, but most of the ad networks have standardized approach. So mm -hmm. it should be, should be all right. And uh, for the report themselves, it depends on the type of metric. When it's just the ratio between different numbers that are already there, it's quite easy. But when it's about calculating, let's say, how many players uh, achieved uh, 30 achievements within the first 30 days. It does, it's not difficult, but it takes a little bit more time, but it's still uh, considering a couple of hours, top days when when you look at it from, from time perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you for like, for the, for the great presentation. Uh, Thank you very much. I think it's, 
I think it's like you know the, the time to like wrap up and uh, uh, bring the all speakers like you know and uh, 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 thank you again all of you for your time and uh, like you know sharing the knowledge. Uh, thank you for like answering the uh, the question. Maybe we could like you know discuss at the end just like one uh, last uh, uh, last last question. Like uh, there was actually a few uh, discussion points uh, around that. Like, do you see as those systems and like those approaches as we presented as kind of trade offs or like uh, how do you see it as like? Uh, or is the, the is, is the is the journey for the like for the company that is growing from like you know a smaller to the bigger side? How do you see it actually? And maybe starting from uh, from Martin. Okay, thanks, thanks, Marius. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's, it's it's always about the tool that you need, and it's about the plans for the company. And if you're a startup, then obviously you're not gonna build anything like Pixel Federation. Uh, mm -hmm. Eventually, uh, that becomes your even a competitive advantage uh, if you can build something like that. Uh, but I think that it's really about careful planning of uh, your situation. Uh, in our case, it's obviously a trade-off. Like in case there was a big product, uh, we would be able to evaluate a lot of things with our setup. But once there's millions on the line, uh, there definitely would have to be an internal BI team, which probably would kind of build stuff on top of our solution, for example. Uh, but as it is now, it's kind of good for evaluating stuff up to a certain level. Uh, then probably you're just going to have to make it much more custom. But uh, the beauty of the solution is you start here and you can just build on top of it. Uh, so if it's done smartly from the beginning, um, there, there doesn't come a point where, for example, you need to switch the whole setup uh, and retool the whole team, right? It's, it's kind of expandable because you've got all the data already there. And uh, it's, it's a good starting point. So that would be my my answer to that. And then maybe building on that, Adam, like you know, if you look at the future, how actually how do you think uh, like this whole analytics stack uh, and the whole analytics system will evolve on your side? Yes. So how do you see it? Like, uh, uh, is there do you see any limitations uh, uh, today, or like the, do you see any uh, need for like the future integrations? How do you see it? Um, with, with regards to the analytics stack, like, you know, like uh, Mihal already presented, you know, Pixel Federation seems to have, from what I've observed, you know, one of the more advanced uh, stacks that I've seen, certainly. Um, we're not quite that size, so, you know, we don't have that level of complexity. Um, I want to touch a little bit on what Martin just said, which is it's really based on where you are, the talent that you have, and also not going down the wrong path, right? So, you know, you don't want to get stuck in technology and code that you're going to have to rip out or, you know, maybe, you know, employees possibly that you're going to have to reshuffle. Um, that's always kind of the trade off. Right. Um, but at the same time, you need to you need to balance the um, the uh, the inaction and, you know, the fact that you got to make a decision with the fact that you need to um, get some insight in some some direction. Now, to answer your question, like around this, you know, where, where I've seen, I think, um, where I've seen some of this, let's say, you know, be put to good work is is uh, being getting access to that data, right? That of course is really like the, the first step that you need to get. And then you need to have people that are willing to read it and look after it and, and, and action it. And I think that sometimes we get a little bit too caught up in advanced analytics and some really crazy technology rather than really just kind of, you know, looking at the data drawing some insight, testing some stuff, talking to people on the team, all right, and pushing, let's say, new solutions in, watching them and iterating, right? So maybe so maybe then building on that, like, uh, like Michal, uh, in this case, like, if you would be able to do it, like, a uh, second time, like, if you would do it, like, some such system again, uh, what you would do actually differently? Yeah, actually, great, great insights uh, from both of you guys. Uh, the first thing is like, okay, also mm, attaching or yeah, the, you have to have your foundation, found the foundations, foundations, right? Yeah, right. You can't be really if you if you build something on your own or you invest a lot of time in some technology and then you have to throw it away because it's rubbish. It takes a lot of 
like it can have really bad impact on the team. And at the end, it's all, the, it's all about the people. It's not about the technology. It's about the people and how they actually come up with uh, new solutions and ask, answering questions and so on. So the technology can be anything, basically. But if I started, like I, I can I can say only from from my side. But I would choose something that's that's already been proven in different companies and start from there. So I know where the problems are, where what which is the path that I don't want to take, and so on. So because we've had we actually hit some some death. Uh, dead ends uh, over the over the time with uh, choosing the right technology and we wouldn't have to do it now so in this case like the whole bigquery ecosystem and google studio or whatever it actually might be one of the one of the picks if i could choose <laughs> and it's not only up to me <laughs> Uh, and uh, so maybe in this case, maybe last question, uh, uh, like, you know, are you, uh, how actually are you measuring or are, are you measuring any data for China as the example? For Pixel, like we are not that uh, yet present in China, but uh, we might have this uh, discussion or we might have some insights after maybe this year or next year. So we're not really present there. So. Is. We're not either. We don't have a huge user base in China right now. So sorry about that. OK, OK. <laughs> same here, same here. Uh, okay. <laughs> On the crack. <laughs> sorry, Marius. Maybe next We all love it. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think like, you know, a little bit even over the time, like, I would like to thank you again for, for your time, for like, you know, spending your time on like preparation, presentation, sharing the knowledge and answering the, uh, the questions. Thank you to the, to the whole audience for like staying with us. Uh, it was um, some time. I hope you enjoyed you. Uh, you uh, got some value out of that. Uh, actually, we are really hungry for any feedback, so please uh, share with us uh, any, uh, any feedback. We'll actually follow up with you on, uh, on that. So if you could actually fill out that uh, short uh, 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 survey that we uh, 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 prepared, then uh, just uh, go to go slash uh, um, game cam feedback. And then uh, you can actually see it in the in the live uh, in the live uh, comments. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we'll, we would like to invite you again for the for the next webinar that will be happening every three four uh, weeks. And you will have the whole information at the game camp at the Google for Startups campus uh, website. Thank you all. Uh, we wish you the nice day and see you the next time. Yep. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Everyone. Thanks, Marius. Thank Wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.